Hello, everybody, and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog and podcast, A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill, and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 1,000 comedians and counting over the last 46 years. I'm delighted to welcome today my very special guest, the impressionist and comedian, Mr. Josh Berry. Yeah! Oh, wow. You did, you, did, you did go bananas. You promised you go bananas. <laughs> really How are you? You're all right. Fact, but you definitely went bananas. That's good. Yeah. Hello. You, do, you, do, <laughs> you doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing all right. Thank you, mate. Yeah, the sun is shining. I'm Isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, the, obviously there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world, but none of it's happening to me. So, um, Good man. I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted. And I'm delighted you're a guest today. Uh, the interview is going to be about 45 minutes to an hour and it's going to be all about your comedy career, my friend. Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. going to go right back to the start. And can you tell me, please, how did you become a comedian and impersonator in the first place? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I sort of, I would probably say I started off as an impersonator. Although like, I think when I was a kid, like when I was really young, I was like eight, I used to do like characters and stuff at school and I guess sort of quite a classic um, depiction of a comedian. I was a bit of a sort of, you know, trying to make people laugh in class. And and uh, I know a lot of comedians are quite quiet, which I am as well. But I think at that point, I sort of, I don't know, my parents are going through a divorce. So oh, <laughs> I was like trying, to, trying to act up for a bit of happiness, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then kind of in my teenage years, I started doing impressions. Um, I started doing impressions of like tennis players uh predominantly which is obviously very niche i got to about 16 years old and i started doing them with some mates and they put a video online of me doing those impressions and they um got picked up quite a lot by the tennis world it was very bizarre like seeing my phone like blow up because like novak <laughs> djokovic uh who i'd done an impression of like tweeted out this video it's, it's mad things it's quite a long time ago now um, but um, yeah, it was really bizarre. And then from there, I sort of was doing all these media interviews, which is weird because I feel like in, in many respects like my career kind of happened in reverse because I feel like most comics, they start doing stand up and stuff. And then, and then, you know, when you want to promote something and you're a bit further down the line, then you do the media stuff. But I was doing yeah. media before I had anything to promote or indeed was particularly funny, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I was doing all of that around the time of like Wimbledon. I started doing like, specific kind of like private gigs where I just come in and deliver some pretty shit jokes about <laughs> um, about uh, tennis and tennis players at like the Wimbledon tennis writers lunch or something lame um so from there like I had a lot of fun doing that but I didn't really sort of see how that would be a career so I went to university um and then kind of started doing it a bit more at university actually towards the end sure um and then because of social media, I, I, I got a few more, uh, I got quite a lot of traction on some stuff. I met Andy Murray and we did like a clip together. Brilliant. He's, he's, he's great. He's, yes. He's so, so fun. And he was like, oh, you know, you sh I should interview me as me. That would be really funny. <laughs> so we, we did that. And um, yeah, from there, I started, I started doing impressions on Uni and Jack Radio, who do a lot of comedy and I still yeah. work with them. They're, they're great. Um, Started, I went to the, the Fringe in 2018, and then I sort of started doing a bit more stand-up. And from there, like, you know, I still do impressions, but I would say I sort of started to discover characters a bit more, which kind of was my first comedy love, I would say. I loved characters and sketch, certainly as a kid growing up, and I viewed that as a bit closer to sort of the sort of comedian that I wanted to be. Right. Um, and, and, and from there, sort of started doing, yeah, more character stuff. Although, yeah, you know, you see my stand-up, I still do, it's like stand-up with impressions in it. But um, yeah, that, that's pretty much the, 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 the story. It's so I, good. I say, uh, it's so good how you started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where was your first ever comedy gig then? When did you actually stand up and do your comedy? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's weird because I feel like I sort of started twice. So I had, you know, like corporate performances. And you know what? I don't even remember the first one. I think it might have been, yeah, I think it might have been something at Wimbledon in 2013. Right. When I was 
But then I also, I also went out, this was amazing. This was, I can't believe I did this. I went out to Dubai as a 17 year old to go and do impressions at their tennis tournament, like in sixth form. I felt like the coolest guy. Wow. And people at school didn't really uh, approve how cool that was. They, uh, <laughs> but, but I thought it was very cool. It, and, it um, is. <laughs> it, it, was, it was great, you know, to make a load of, again, just really awful jokes, like really yeah. unfunny, really bad material. Um, Doesn't really matter, special. mate. It's all experience. Sure, sure. But then um, the first sort of stand-up gig I did was on the Black Circuit in 2018. I came right. and sort of did some impressions. I was in March. I remember it was in Brick Lane um, at the, at the uh, it's, uh, I think it's 1001 Cafe in Shoreditch. Right. I think it was. And um, very supportive crowd, very nice audience. It was really nice. A lot of my mates came out to watch, which was really kind of them. Um, and yeah, I, I, I started then and then, you know, started doing more and more gigs and unsurprisingly it was, you know, absolutely terrible at the start, but you know, you get better. So. All experiences, that's it. So, so, so what year was this again when you first So that was, started? that was 2018. I mean, 2018. So I, yeah. Yeah. So, so God, three years ago now, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. March, 2018. When you, when you said about um, uh, going to Dubai, going to Dubai, Mm. Um, my day job is working in a school. I work on a school reception. Mm. And the first history teacher, the first head of history teacher at the school, who I got mm. to know really well, decided mm. he wanted to become a comedian. And, mm. he, and he, he went on a course, um, won it, and he's now running a comedy club in Dubai. It's unbelievable. Oh, really? Unbelievable. It's, it's, it's such a success story. So it's all about, as I said before, the experience. Just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Oh, for sure. Fine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting as well how um, how many teachers. Yeah. Go on. To, you know, Frank Skinner was a teacher. Yeah. Who wasn't he? Frankie Boyle, I think, was yeah. a teacher. Greg Davies, loads of yeah. them. My um, my my view with that is um, because they have to stand up and perform in front of an audience, mm, in their audience, mm. kids. They have. to all comedians have to have a certain amount of ego, I think, or anybody who stands up and does a presentation, they have to have the confidence to get up and do it. Mm. And, and I think that's the answer to that. I think that's why a lot of them do become comedians. It, 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 it is interesting because um, mm. uh, I have to sometimes supply all the admin to the teachers and watching them deliver the, the um, teaching to the class is yeah. like watching stand-up comedy because with a comedian that they have to walk out and within a minute they mm. have to like that they have to get the audience on the side and then they're away you know and mm. you do that very very well you're very oh, easy you. on stage and you're very easy going and very confident with the audience so they they warm to you and you can then do, get away with what you want really, which is I, great I think it's, um, the helpful thing i found with that honestly is I mean, social media has been amazing just in that it, it just allows you, like, I know my audience really well, right? Yeah. I, know, I know exactly who comes to my, <laughs> to my gigs. Uh, as a lot of management consultants, you know, like if Stuart Lee plays to the metropolitan liberal elite, I think I just play to the metropolitan elite. I would say there's, they're not necessarily liberal. Yeah. Um, although a lot of them are. I, so that it makes it easier. I think, I think right. when, you know, when you're first starting, it's much harder because you've got to, you're feeling your audience out and you don't really have one yet. But yeah, I think that that's been a real blessing for me because it yeah. just means that there's a series, you know, like if I ask them where they're from and they'll tell me, you know, it, it will be some, someone will say somewhere in the home counties and that just is very easy to mock, right? Like, um, <laughs> it's so predictable. And, and they laugh because they know that they know that like everyone else there is just like them and that they've come from Guildford or whatever. And, um, it's, you know, it's, it's very, it's very fun. Um, but also I think that I always feel like you're gigging to really posh crowds. Right. Um, you know, and doing like corporates with posh people. I've seen loads of comics do this, and I think it's absolutely the right way to play it. The more you can take the piss out of them for having a lot of money, they they, they love it because, <laughs> because because the joke is really in their favour, right? Because they're like, oh yes, well I do have a lot of money actually, <laughs> and uh, so it's sort of like mockery, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It really plays very well. It yeah. reflects very nicely on them. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. 
Have you ever have you ever played Carlisle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not yet. I'm thinking, My I'm home thinking, city. Uh, I'm doing Carlisle on the tour though. So a lot of the comedians are going up there, my friend. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, because it's I it's it's to... it's a catchment audience because it's on the border between England and Scotland. Mm. So whether you'll get an audience, I've no idea. But uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, it is a very nice place to play. I have to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do enjoy that. I enjoy the sort of like I did one in Cumbria, yeah, or the Fringe in 2019, and that was yeah. um, that was great. It was a really beautiful drive, and uh, oh, it's a lovely place, yeah, absolutely yeah. gorgeous area. Yeah, it really is. It's um, really nice to see the UK. I mean, I I, I feel like I don't um, I don't see it. It you know I would. There are so many places that you just never visit, right? You know, normally, even like, uh, yeah, just just all over the UK, like you wouldn't yeah. have a reason to go there. And one of the nice things about stand up is that you do, and you get to sort of see. That's exactly it. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, to date, I can't ever imagine you having a bad gig because you've oh, always made well, me laugh so much <laughs> when I've seen you. Um, to date, what's been your best and worst comedy gig? Oh, as um. Well, the way, I'll start with the best one and then we'll have the worst for pudding because the worst is quite funny. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the best, it's difficult with the best one because like, the gigs that I always feel like most exhilarated after are like ones, you know, where you're like trying out new stuff and, and it works and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, you know, because there's nothing like that feeling. I'm sure all the other comics who come on this say the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's nice when a show like absolutely rips. Yeah obviously um but it's nicer when it's stuff you didn't know if it was good or whether you didn't know whether it was good or not and then it and then it rips you're like oh that's amazing um so actually i mean yeah i have a lot of fun doing the work in progress stuff i i really enjoyed doing leicester square theater in 2020 yeah um because just because like i remember like they were like oh do you want to do it and i was like well, there's so many seats there's no way that i'll fill that and we we did just about because I was just well done. Like, Congratulations! Like, uh, thanks. Um, and, and it had just been, you know, I'd be like really worried about doing the gig. And I was like, oh my god, it's so many people. But it was, uh, yeah, it was really nice, and the, the crowd were great and everything. So mm. I think that just because of sort of the emotional lead up to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say that one. Worst one. Well, there, there are two actually. There, I'll, I'll give you a two for one. There's, I did a, a corporate <laughs> gig. At the Hurlingham Club. Do you know the Hurlingham Club? I've heard of it. Yeah, it's like a really snooty. <laughs> well, no, they're not. There's some really nice people there, actually. That's not that's not entirely fair. But anyway, there are some very snooty people there. And I got up and I'd done it the year before and they booked me again, which I think was a mistake because, you know, you, you, you can't reinvent a whole act. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> in, in this place of 12 months. So it was sort of doomed to fail, but I, yeah, it was bad. It was uncomfortable. I was sort of doing oh, this my Edinburgh show and it's like, oh God. Um, and there were like some like really nice young people. There's sort of young people who are members of the club who are sort of really supportive and like enjoying it. And then there were some older people there who just, who just weren't interested at all. Didn't you know, get it just, at all. Oh, well, they just didn't look up. Like that, oh, was, that was part of the problem. Um, why are so, they yeah. there? Huh? Why, why do they go if they're not interested? It's, well, it, it, yeah, I find it's that thing, baffling. But, it, but that's, that's the, the, the difficult thing with, with corporate gigs, isn't it? I guess they yeah. don't want, they actually don't really want comedy. They just think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, so that can be like pretty horrible. But yeah, so that was, um, that was fairly humiliating. And then afterwards, you know, you've got people coming up to you being like, oh, you know, I wouldn't have done that. Or, uh, I, you know, you're just like, oh, God, why? And I go away. <laughs> yeah, right. I, think I, was, I was really young at that point. I was like 21 or maybe I think it was just 22. And so I made the stupid idiot mistake of being like, oh, I'll hang out with these people for the rest of the night, which is just no. <laughs> Yeah, right. There's a reason why people leave very, very swiftly after. Oh, game. man. If you smash it, you don't want to be there. And if you are awful, you don't want to be there. Either way, it's never good. Um, <laughs> it was kind of just after the game that was bad. But I think the worst one by far was my worst 
Oh, this is, this is, yeah. So there was a, it was a corporate gig on a boat, right? Right. <laughs> um, you know, one of those gigs in like, uh, I think near Westminster kind of area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In 2018, this was. And I, <laughs> I, uh, what they, what they'd done is they got six half hours of comedy, one after the other, after the other, after the other, for some <laughs> fucking. Too thing. much, even for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know. I think you know. I, oh, I know. I, obviously, you, you love it, but I could watch. I could watch three hours of comedy like in a day at the yeah, film. yeah. I yeah. think after that, I'd be like, okay, that's yeah. that's probably enough. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, they were like, yeah, let's do three hours in a row for a corporate gig, right? And they're all sat there, and I come out, and you know, just nothing, no applause, and, <laughs> you know, like just absolutely nothing. And I'm really, I, I'm, by the way, I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily blaming them. I'm actually probably blaming the organizer because I think, you know, at a corporate gig, you want maybe 15 minutes max. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also, you know, you know, I'm very tall, right? I'm six foot six. So yeah, I, yeah, so am I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. My head was scraping the top of this boat, right? It was too, so that was a problem. So I was like, I can't move. I literally cannot move inside so, this fucking boat. So not only was it difficult, you couldn't move. Yeah, right, right, right. And I'm doing sort of, I don't know, yeah, routines that uh, I've, I've very uh, fondly uh, left in the past, let's put it yeah. that way. Yeah, um, yeah. And I can't remember, I, you know, very fresh to comedy, having done it maybe about nine months. So, you know, I'm not oh, really particularly good at that point. Um, but, you know, started off with a very hack, like, oh, I was on the bus the other day. Ha, ha, ha. And uh, <laughs> um, which is terrible. It just makes me want to, like, I just hate myself for even saying that at the time. And uh, <laughs> some bloke after I Never said doubt that, yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, but I don't know. I think that's quite normal for most stand ups. It's yeah, like yeah. self reflection and then intense self loathing, right? Yeah. It's like, why did I do? I, I feel like that about not all work. I've, I think more recently, probably because it's not as bad as it was, but I, I like some of it. But a lot of it, you look back on and you're like, oh, what was I, what was I doing? <laughs> what the fuck was that, you idiot? Like, who would say that? Um, but yeah, so, I, so um, I said that and then some bloke from the crowd was like, oh, really? Um, <laughs> as, as a heckle. And I'm just sort of like, all right, fine. Um, and you know that I think a big, you know, now I would be like, ah, oh, I shall try and befriend this. Yeah, man. yeah. We'll work through this together. This is that's which is exactly the right way to do it, right? Exactly. Now. Yeah. The wrong way to do it is to go nuclear and like try and rip him to shreds, which is what I did. <laughs> I felt uncomfortable in the space, right? Um, you know, and that that was actually a really good lesson I learned at the first fringe I did. It's like, you know, don't don't murder people because it, no. It, there's no benefit like if someone shouts out you can make them look silly and undermine them sure but like not yeah don't don't absolutely slay them which is what i did um and i was talking about his mom or something which is just oh god and this makes me visceral i'm like sweating how, how cringe i find this oh. if it, well if it if it, and, if, uh, it if it makes sorry, you feel any better if it makes you feel any better yeah. i've had a go at stand-up comedy right and it was how, a disaster. It, it was a disaster. I, I, I went. I, I said to the promoter, I said, "People find me quite funny in pubs. When I go to the pub, I'd like to have a go at stand-up comedy." He said, "There's a, a gong show for mm. old people." On <laughs> and, rude. and, and we've got and, we, and, 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 and that was. I, I thought, well, I'm on a loser already, you know, because the way he said it. Um, <laughs> and 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 he said, and he said. Um, it's a Monday afternoon. It was raining, so I did. The, I I did this script, um, mm. which was all about me um, being accident prone in Carlisle driving cars, which I thought mm. was quite funny. Mm. And he said, "Oh, it's brilliant." He said, "You've got three minutes. If they gong you, you have to walk off." So I walked out, and there was three people in the audience. Oh, uh, and and uh, horrible. Oh. just horrible. And 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 I went, "Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon." And just for a, an opening line, I said, yeah. um, "People, you uh, people think I look like Eddie the Eagle Edwards, the ski jumper, which I am. Is his double? I'm, I'm his double." Mm. <laughs> but I said, "I can't see the resemblance myself." And somebody at the back just went, "Fuck off!" and got me off. 
and I really? walked off to my own footsteps. Was that it? And the what promoter said, have another go, have right? another go. So I went on again, similar thing happened, and I said, I don't know whether I could do this. I said, I think my uh, thing is in the audience. My thing is in the audience supporting all these people who can actually yeah. do it better than me. Never say <laughs> never again, but... <laughs> That's a bit of a baptism of fire, though, Richard. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's very. That's not a very supportive crowd. I just, yeah, I think you've got to have been going for a bit before you do it. Again, so. <laughs> never it say never again. Never say never again. Let's... Yeah, yeah. That's hard, <laughs> though. But, yeah, it um, was very hard. <laughs> that's, that's not very fair. But no. yeah, maybe he was the same man who was at this gig. That I do. <laughs> I um, don't know. Possibly. But he... Let's let's move on to happier things. Can okay. you please? describe the process of creating an impression what yeah. comes first with you is it the voice or the look or anything else um i actually don't think i'm that good at creating the look or certainly not as good as like bremner or people like that or right. you know, they're very good at sort of molding their face like roy bremner does that brilliantly with um with boris johnson and and um and Donald Trump and, and loads of people actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, it's um, it comes from sort of the voice. I would say uh, you sort of you know you pick out like a little phrase or you know like Gordon Ramsay, good example. Gordon Ramsay instead of saying rest restaurant, like he will say um, restaurant. Like, or <laughs> some of his vowels like slightly like he'll be like um, you know it's uh, it's a bit of a busman's holiday. Um, <laughs> a busman's holiday. I think from Scotland, right? So the, there's a bit of there's a bit of trace. Of some of the Scottish uh, ways of ways of talking, or say like um, gar it's not quite like gar it's not saying like garlic, um, <laughs> but he but he does sort of it's sort of between how I would say like garlic and and garlic, like it's sort of in between those two. So you, you see the little traces, um, but that's actually quite helpful, sort of learning someone's like heritage or yeah. whatever, because um, you sort of get a bit of it, because you know. I find accents fascinating. There's this really interesting guy on YouTube called Eric Singer, and he's a dialect coach. And right. if you're an accent nerd, like I am, you'll love it. He goes through one of the most interesting ones. He talks about different American accents relative to like immigration patterns and everything. Yeah, so yeah. You see a lot of like some accents in America sound like um, they sound like East Anglia because of immigration patterns and because of, you know, obviously like the Irish settlers and, and uh, English people coming over to America. So anyway, the just i think just understanding like the, the mechanics of it is really yeah, sure yeah 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 um, but, but but also just the fact that people are inconsistent with their with their accent so that, that gordon ramsay example is a perfect it's really yeah 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 um, yeah um yeah. and and following on from that do you have any favorite impersonations that you do yeah you know i i quite like doing i quite like doing louis theroux i've done louis <laughs> I've done Louis for quite a long time now, and I, I sort of like it. I, I sort of think it's it's great. I haven't really seen anyone else do Louis, and um, it's unique. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I, I I like I just love Louis. I love his. I'm a really big. Fan. I've like watched all of his work. I'm a really he's brilliant, fan. isn't he? He's such a good documentary maker. Yeah, and he's super clever is yeah. he's like really considered and and has a very um defined well-defined style and you know i think some people are like oh well his dad was very like you know he's like a big travel writer and he had links to the bbc and it's like yeah but he is also excellent it's not like he's do, do you know what i mean he sure he had contacts but he's he's sure. really brilliant at what he does yeah. um and his i really enjoyed his podcast series he's a very sort of like yeah i think he's a uh, I guess like an intellectual role model because he's such a he's so clever in the way that he's yeah 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 presents himself. Um, yeah. So yeah, it comes that comes from a sort of adoration, I think, of what what he does. And actually, I couldn't work out for such a long time, ever since I started, how to package that impression in a way that was funny because it would always because it's quite low energy. It would always always fall flat, and I just didn't know why because I was like, I feel like this impression is good. People <laughs> tell me it's good. Um, so well, I got it recently talking about like um it sounds like quite a banal topic but talking about like anxiety and, and 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 i'm very aware like my audience is quite a lot of fairly sort of unreconstructed men probably with fairly antiquated attitudes to mental health and all that kind of stuff yeah and talking about the kind of men's like no, no, no I, I don't feel i don't feel emotion i don't actually ever feel stress ever like it just doesn't ever affect me 
And I realized the ways to get Louis Theroux in would just be like, you know, me, me stood there talking about how I'm trying to Louis Theroux some self-awareness into these people and be like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've got a lot of problems. Do you want to know, are you sure you don't want to talk about that? <laughs> and that made more sense because I think it was like pulling out something that was like the comic point of that, right? Which was that, well, I, I guess maybe a serious point, which is that no one's bulletproof. But yeah. also sort of using an impression to, to sort of tease that out. That felt more natural and created a bit more comedy, I'd say. Sure, yeah. What a what a what a brilliant answer. Um have there been any difficult impersonations that you've tackled that have caused you bother to get them right or have taken mm -hmm. a lot longer? Yeah, I always used to find Corbin quite difficult actually. Right. Um because his voice is pretty non-distinctive. Um, I think that's the thing. It's like the more distinctive someone is, the easier it probably is to do them. But then equally, there's a depth issue. Like, and like, I, you know, lots of people do Morgan Freeman, which is fine, but it's very like done. Yeah. Um, he's too deep for me. I think. I, yeah. I think I actually have quite a sort of medium, maybe maybe sometimes slightly higher voice. My range is a bit higher. So someone like James Acas is very easy because he's got a sort of slightly more shrill voice. But <laughs> there are some people who, yeah, maybe like. <laughs> you know, as I become an older man, I'll be able to do. Um, but yeah, at 25, it's a bit more, a bit more of a challenge. But yeah, like, you know, people like Tim Henman, I kept Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before, <laughs> it's like, there's nothing really there to do. I mean, his, his voice isn't a million miles away from mine. So I found it quite hard not to just be myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be my answer to that. What, what, what is fascinating, especially when I've seen you live, is that you do do an impersonation of quite a few fellow comedians so mm, you've got you mm. you do james aircaster you do josh widdicombe i've seen you do ian yeah, yeah, yeah. i saw you do a brilliant um routine which was all scottish based where you started oh yeah, yeah, yeah i thought that was wonderful that that, that, that right. really went well um uh, I have a testimonials page on my blog and a lot of comedians have put uh, very nice things down. I got one from James Acaster and he said, if I wasn't a comedian, I would happily sit next to Richard Gill all day and make him laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that's so that, that that is that lovely. That's, so <laughs> that's really nice. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> I'd very happily sit next to Richard Gill all day and I'd make him laugh. Thank you. I think he's a really good egg, James Acaster. Oh, he's fantastic. He's really yeah. good. Yeah. I listened to him on um, Paul Chowdhury's podcast. Have you have you heard that one? Uh, I know it exists. Uh, have I heard? It? Yes, I I do listen to a lot of them. Mm. Um, but I don't think I've come across his. No, is it is that very good? It is good, yeah. It, I, I just think it, it. I just found it quite interesting because he's sort of talking about, you know, being a stand-up and his kind of emotional state and, and yeah. being. I think you know a sensitive. And I say that as a as a, a very sensitive man. Like he's he come. He strikes me as a sensitive man. I think that's um yeah that's a good thing. I, I think it's a really important. Like it's a power because it allows you to move people. I think if you're sensitive, because you have an interest in like very much so, you know. And, and there's also there's also an honesty as well when you're on mm. stage, very much so. And and that warms the audience. It it, it warms mm. you to the audience more, and you become more endearing. Um, Absolutely, because we can unite definitely in, in in humor, but also in sadness. I mean, there's the end at the end of his Netflix special, the final one, a recap. I think it is. He's talking about. Have you seen it? He's got like a. I've seen all three of them at Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if this would have been in the Edinburgh version, but he's right. talking about he's doing this monologue as a duck. It's very yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. But he's also <laughs> talking about like wooden ducks and how wooden ducks like, um, you know, are there to like hoodwink other ducks into being shot, and he and he gives this really like really endearing like quite emotional like a monologue for this duck who's like full of like hope and he's like oh i've got all my baby ducks and i love them so much and i can't wait and just go and see them tonight and everything and then the end of the routine is just the duck being shot <laughs> <laughs> and it's, but it's it's so funny but it's also like it's so sad and i just thought there's something um <laughs> there's really great in that right because that's one of my favorite things of uh, the genius of the office i think is 
Yeah. I always cry when Tim and Dawn get together. It's just one of the most like beautiful, yeah. excellently executed things. The, and then the, straight after, Ricky Gervais is making you laugh. And it, it, there's just yeah. something brilliant about uh, yeah. pinballing from, from, from tragedy to comedy, I think. The, the, the wonderful thing about The Office was that nobody knew it was a comedy series because of the way yes. it was recorded. Yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah, and that's yeah, the genius yeah. of it. Um, <laughs> it is incredible. How do you remember all your routines? Uh, good question. I don't. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> that, that's the problem. I actually. So, um, when when did I see you last? Was it was uh, you at the, uh, the Camden Comedy Club? Yeah, not the Camden that, Comedy Club. Two North Down for the Camden Fringe. Yeah. When? So what? I think it was about like two April, weeks ago. The eighth of August. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like straight after that, I got quite ill. I, I had this horrible summer cold that everyone's been having. Uh, yeah. um, but I'm fine. But it was, um, my mate has it and he's been in bed for like three weeks. It's horrible. Um, but I came back and did a work in progress and my brain was still not totally with it. Yeah. And I was surprised because I was like, oh shit, I can't remember half of these routines. <laughs> um, so yeah i think but the, honestly the way i would try to do it is just like i try and just write the set like by hand or, or at least like deliver it in my house yeah a few times but um there's also there's nothing like i think as i've like become a bit more established and done more gigs and become more confident and comfortable on stage when it's going well you'll have like sort of half half thoughts in your head and it'll work in progress you maybe be like all right yeah, I'll, I'll try that out see if that's any good um, and if I'm feeling particularly confident, I'll do that. If I'm not, then I'll probably just retreat back into the material that I know is a bit more established. But um, yeah, so some of it is improvised, I guess. And some of it is, you know, relative to the audience. And I, I feel a bit more comfortable improvising now than I, than I used to. But um, yeah, I think, I think, um, I feel like that's like the trajectory. I, I, I don't know, I've listened to Stuart Lee speak about this and he talks about how he just sort of has bullet points on his hand and he tries to improvise around those bullet points. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm at the stage, I'd say, where I sort of, I'm not that advanced, but I have um, probably jokes that I know I need to get to at various points to sort of keep it, you know, keep the routine up. Um, and then everything around that is sort of, sort of yeah, kind of a bit freer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, other, other than my blog, um, the most creative thing I ever did, I've, I've, I've written a half hour play, which me and, me and my mate put on in um, 2007 and raised a lot of money for comic relief. Um, it was, it was, thank you. We put on three shows. It was called the, it's called the applicant. Yes. And it's basically, it's basically me coming down from Carlisle to London, yes. <clears throat> trying to get a job, excuse me. And um, uh, I have a successful girlfriend who's got a job and I, I can't get a job. So it's a series of interviews. Uh, and my mate plays the interviewer and I play the interview. Uh, the, the, uh, um, oh, sorry, the interviewing. Cut, cut out there for about 10 seconds. It's sorry, all right, mate. No worries. No worries. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, okay. I don't know what happens. No, sorry. it's fine. No worries. I'm just um, I'm just talking about I'm just talking about the 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 play that I wrote and um, it, it was called the applicant and it's basically um, uh, a series of interviews that I go through to try and get my perfect job so so uh, there's hmm. two scenes in each act there's me chatting to the audience because it's the waiting room and I'm very nervous so it's all monologue. And then there's uh, mm. the interview itself. And my mate's very good at accents like you are, and he played all different interviews. <clears throat> so on the first night of this, I ran out I ha and I had this great, I had this great long monologue. I ran out and I forgot it. And I, and we'd spent, <laughs> and, the, and, 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 and we'd spent 10 weeks rehearsing it. And I'm oh, thinking yeah. I wrote the bloody thing. And it, I was just like a rabbit in headlights. So. You have my admiration for remembering well, it all and doing but it. But that's all. what you're doing is harder, I think, because you're you're having to remember something that is like a, a sort of very um, tied up piece of art, if you like. Yeah. Whereas with stand up, if I forget or get distracted, I almost get bonus points for that because that makes me a bit closer to the audience anyway. You know. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's that's so it is easier. That's very true. Yeah. 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 Um. I saw and really enjoyed your work in progress shows for your forthcoming tour at the Leicester yeah. Comedy Festival in 2020, just before yeah. the pandemic hit. 
and more recently at the Cameron Fringe in August 2021. Describe your writing process and where you get your ideas from for your show. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. If you have any. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I, I could do with getting some, yeah. Um, I was, Kings don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, well, it's interesting. I was just chatting to my my good mate. Sorry, this, my friend Tom Tom Lucy, who oh yeah yeah, the, yeah. The, the stand up just before this, and we were just Me talking man. about you know, this. I think mean, this is so fundamentally true. Like to be good, you gotta like self awareness is so important. I think right, like and and the, I, the best comedians are like the ones who are the most optimally self aware. Like uh, actually, Bill Burr is a really good example. Like he knows exactly how he looks, comes across, and yeah. sounds. Um, but what I love about him is how he manages to Trojan horse so many liberal ideas. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? To an audience. Exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, he's, he's actually like convincing them of, you know, he does some wonderful things at the end of um, Paper Tiger about, yeah. you know, deconstructing like male toxic attitudes to emotion. Like it's so clever. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of my writing process just comes from like thinking about myself and how I'm perceived, I guess. Although at least, I, yeah, I'd say like a lot of my comedy is maybe going a bit more in that direction. It's become a bit more introspective. Like I love Bo Burnham stuff and that probably made me think, I maybe kind of want to write more about myself than, than, than other people. But then, yeah, it's a balance, isn't it? Like I sort of, it also comes from sort of observing people or trends that I think yeah. are silly or things that irritate me and I want to get off my chest or also just sort of life experiences that I just think are inherently funny. like. Yeah, I do just the fact that I on quite a few adverts do dog noises and that's my sort of bread and butter. I just think there's something inherently amusing about that because it's so like it's so odd because at one on one end, like it's it's incredibly well paid. It's like one of the best paid things you can do, but it's also so humiliating and low status. But I just think there's something really funny about the relationship between those two things. But um that's probably for my stand-up. I know we're going to go and talk about Rafe and... and yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rafe I'm just about to come on to him. But for that, that, that comes more from, like, looking at what I perceive the elite to be and what I think... Pol what, how people feel about politicians at the moment um, and sort of generally, like, the political landscape as well as sort of people... Yeah, people that I observe. So I, I get... It's not a very good answer, I think. <laughs> but I think it's just... I know what you mean. It's a big soup of lots of different things. It's like, yeah. sometimes like, you know, you have thoughts and stuff. I like, I quite like doing a lot of comedy about vulnerability, or at least that's something I'd like to sort of move into a bit more or, or stuff about yourself that you don't really like. But I think there's something interesting in that. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of stuff, thoughts that my mind throws out and a lot of them are absolute shit. And then hopefully a couple of them are decent enough to sort of- Yeah, yeah, something. yeah. Fascinating. Let's let's move on to your character, Rafe Hubris. How how did he come about? Because he's obviously more character based than just a straight impression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've always sort of wanted to do that more than impressions, to be honest. Like, um, I, I really enjoy, you know, obviously, like Coogan is amazing. I love Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, that was the stuff that I found the most fun. Like you know like mr g as well and all that all that stuff yeah 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 you know and like jermaine and everything i just yeah i thought it was just really <laughs> funny and um i felt more at home doing that and i i, I think rafe came from if people who are listening don't know who he is he's a parody conservative party advisor character who lives in clapham and is incredibly <laughs> confident <laughs> in the name hubris um he went to and very well done as well <laughs> oh, thanks. I, i've been around a lot of them richard but, so that's <laughs> that, that's partially the reason you know like it, i i've been around just insanely confident men and sort of thought had a bit of a weird relationship in that like I've, i'm friends with quite a lot of them so i like there's maybe some love in the character i don't know if that necessarily comes across but there's also <laughs> a sort of hatred of maybe some of the entitlement that you see from people like that as well. And yeah, yeah. And um, just also like, it comes from a frustration that like those people seem to work their way to the top without a great degree of talent, right? Um, and that's not to say there aren't people from Eastern who are 
uh, nice and good and sure yeah and, yeah because of course there are but um it just like you know like you got to pick you got to pick like the biggest thing to mock right i think if you're trying to be do something that's mocking something like there's no better target than someone who went to the most expensive boarding <laughs> school and uh, <laughs> arguably the best university working in literally the establishment you know yeah. so, <laughs> um so so that that kind of is where that comes from i read something really interesting the other day about um i don't know if you saw this i can't remember which comedian wrote it i feel guilty not to give them credit but they said that someone had once said to them that comedy is basically like a mockery of public speaking um and but that means that people either uh but no sorry it was like who does public speaking it's either like moral leaders like so like people who you know people from the church yeah. People who are very powerful, politicians or academics, right? So learned people. And his argument was stand up because it's a mockery of that. You have to be deficient in one of those areas. So you're either uh, immoral, like like Dave Chappelle, right? Arguably, Dave Chappelle is high status and intelligent, but immoral. Um, or you're intelligent, moral, but completely powerless, like Stuart Lee, for example. That's uh, fascinating. Or, um, or you're an idiot in inverted commas um like i don't know let's say like lee mac like lee mac is yeah. uneducated or at least that is his that is his persona he's persona, obviously phenomenally, yeah. phenomenally yeah. intelligent phenomenally quick and phenomenally yeah. um the thing about rafe is that i think rafe is all three <laughs> supposedly powerful right but but he's but he's not he's an idiot um he's supposedly educated but he's not he's an idiot and um he supposedly represents establishment morality but he's not you know he's, he's, he's a moral vacuum so that i think that's where i sort of come at that character from and he's also a very good vessel because the joke is he knows all the politicians he's a very good vessel to to mock the politicians that he supposedly works with yeah it's so it's so interesting because we had uh, i had al murray uh, i mm. interviewed him on here mm. and uh he's i said um why do you think the longevity of the character has lasted? And he said, well, um, uh, whatever he says, even if it's complete rubbish, mm. he believes it. Mm. As long mm. as he mm. believes it and say what it lacks. <laughs> sure. What, what as, in, as in real Al Murray believes it? Or the character <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's fascinating how you... I mean, you said you mentioned Steve Coogan and of course Alan Partridge is the one that immediately springs to mind. But how does he get all those characters so infinitely perfect? You know, because because the one you've got, the Rafe Hubris character was spot on, was absolutely spot on. Oh, and, and in your in the work in progress that I saw, you deservedly gave him half the show mm. to really get to grounds and and get to the bottom of the character and what he was all about and and mm -hmm. the more you did the funnier he was oh thanks that's really that's really nice i think um i i think the good thing when you're doing like irony based work is that it does sort of wonderfully work on a lot more levels right because obviously the the whole thing is that i don't mean anything that i say and the audience kind of gets that and i think they <laughs> And, that, and that's what they like you know, they're like and, well, and although sometimes obviously that can still jar like when i'm talking about like you know i'm like oh well you know i think we should probably um you know the thing about free health care is like i just feel like people take it for granted if they don't have to pay for it you know otherwise you know, they might get addicted to like chemotherapy or whatever. Which, not, which for some people is a bit too hard a bit too jarring to say even though yeah I'm yeah sure yeah it's really the idea but it's brilliant um, but yeah, no, it's, he's, he's, he's an interesting character. I think he's got a lot of legs. I enjoy being him. I, I, f I feel more at home being on stage with someone else, I think. Sure, um, right. right. Is, yeah. That's infamously what Ronnie Barker said. If you see him on interviews, he, he was very, very shy as himself. Yeah. And he had yeah. to have a moustache or something right. <laughs> to talk. And, and yet, when he was in character, he was extraordinary. He was a different person. Like, Coogan's like that as well, though. You know. Yeah, yeah, him, yeah. He's very yeah. like. He's very. He seems very uncomfortable. You know? Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Um, but I feel like I don't feel inclined to be that funny as myself. 
to no, be honest. I think I think a lot of comedians aren't. I think I think they're just human and they just want to chat and talk and and sure. you know it's it's extraordinary if you look at somebody like James Gill at Always Be Comedy who compares it. Mm. He psychs himself up before he goes on stage because I've watched him from the front row psyching himself mm. up, and mm. then another person he's like unleashed. And, sure. and he's brilliant with an audience, so that's his great gift, you know. So mm, mm. it's it's fascinating, and yet and and yet afterwards he's straight home. He's never in, he never stays behind. He's off and mm. next one. And it's fascinating how 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 all the comedians work and deliver their craft, you know. And uh, um, yeah. fasc fascinating. Um, let's move on to Edinburgh. You mentioned okay. Edinburgh before. I am very lucky to go to the Edinburgh Fringe every year. I didn't go yes. this year, and I didn't obviously go, of course, last year, but I've been every year from 2005 to 2019. Wow. And I go, uh, it's my holiday, and mm. I go up there for a week, and I see about 50 shows. Wow. I absolutely love it. Um, uh, God, that's insane. <laughs> I need all did by the time I come back. <laughs> yeah, who, in, who did you particularly enjoy? Oh, there's doing? so many. I mean, oh, yeah. um, uh, I saw uh, Michael McIntyre in a hut. I saw Sarah Millican in a hut. I saw mm. um, Russell Howard start off. We always go and see Jason Byrne. Um, yeah, right. He's amazing. He's been on here. Um, mm. What was your first Edinburgh Fringe like and what was it, the experience for you? I know you've touched on it before. Why are yeah. you laughing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just remembering where I stayed. So I, um, I put my accommodation, you know, I wasn't making very much money at that point in my career. Right. I put my accommodation like quite late. And I was staying somewhere that was 19 pounds a night. For the Classy. Eight, eight. <laughs> right, right. Which is, um, which is pretty. And also remember in Edinburgh, you know, like a travel lodge room will probably be about 500 quid a night. So Yes, of course. I, and, and, <laughs> I, and, I, and I got this. in and it didn't have any fucking windows. <laughs> it, was, it was insane. So it was a box. Absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, oh man, I can't believe. Yeah, I had no windows. And I was like, waking up. It's been a up. great time then. <laughs> oh, man, fucking, I can't believe I did that in hindsight. It was also stupid, like, you know, I, I I could have afforded to not live somewhere that was nineteen pounds a night. It was it was it was dreadful. It was so bad. Right. And um, yeah, I was waking up in the middle of the night, like not being able to breathe and like. Oh man, it was it was rough. And my throat got really fucked up. And, like, not good. Um. So what? So what year was this? So that was twenty eighteen. Right. Um. But I'd had all this because I've met like Judy Murray, and she's she's a fucking gem. She's great. Yeah. That woman. I love her. And she um, really kindly gave me a bit of, she was like, oh, if you go to the fringe, you've got to watch this guy. He's, he's brilliant. Guy. You know, so nice. Um, but that gave me some really good PR. And I think often I, I really, I wasn't quite the comic to match the PR that I was given at that point. <laughs> I've been doing setup for about three months. So my show, like I just gone through a breakup and I was 20. Oh, mate. It's very horrible. heartbroken, but also pathetically, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. people go yeah. through breakups, get over it, you pathetic little piece yeah. of shit. And I was like, oh, boo hoo, you know, for like, no one feels sorry. No one feels sorry for you if you've gone through a breakup and you're 22. I don't like people are just like, all right, that's sad, but get over it. <laughs> and I uh, was doing that, like, it was like impressions with moany, sad bits about my life, basically. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was fine. I got through it. It actually sold really well. I mean, it just wasn't a particularly, I mean, it was a, yeah, it was not a good show. Where um, was it? Where was your first show? It was in assembly, uh, not George square, like the, 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 up the, um, assembly George yeah. square gardens. No, it wasn't. It, that was 2019, but, right. um, where's the big, the, the biggest venue is the Bailey room. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah not yeah. that I was playing. Like, obviously, <laughs> obviously not that. Wow, playing, like a, a small, a little, yeah, 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 yeah right in there. Which was um, yeah. I mean, it was it was fun, like phenomenally intense. Like I've never done anything like that. I don't, I'm not sure I'll ever do anything like that again. Was um, that your first solo show then that you took up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I yeah, done stand up three months and then just went and did a solo. And show. you were there. Wow, wow, wow. But, like it was a it was not a good show but i'm pleased i did it because like i'm a big believer you know like some pe people have different philosophies about this and stand up and they're like oh you know do 10 minutes and then 
do oh, 15 yeah. minutes and then work up to an hour. But actually, I, I feel like I really benefited from doing a crap hour because then you move on and you do another hour and the next hour is hopefully better. And then now, like, it's I all experience, like, as I say, you know, sure. like, yeah. I've, you know, and now I'm doing for this tour, like writing, you know, for like 45 and 45, more or less, give or say. Yeah. And that's partially because I did that and I got the ball rolling. Like, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's never going to be great at the, st at the start, but I had fun and I, had, I got very drunk a lot. Yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> My liver good, is yeah. being battered. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> That was super normal and then the next year i did it i was very um i was very like quiet and um right didn't really go out because i was so paranoid about losing my voice because yeah. my act is quite contingent on that um and i just sort of stayed in my room and watched all of fresh meat fantastic <laughs> wow yeah, that was fun it was definitely fun like i don't know if i do a, i don't know if i do a whole run again like i go for a week and do some work in progress stuff but yeah yeah um, yeah I didn't love being there for the whole month. 20, 25 nights is very full on. Yeah. And I also just don't think, I don't really know. Like I was like, I don't know who I'm benefiting being here for that amount of time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a week would be great. And yeah. Like, yeah, come and watch, I'll work some stuff out and then I can hopefully take it around the UK or whatever. But yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, you know, and it's expensive. It's tough. It's really, if you're a working class act, that's really, it's really unfair. Yes. Yeah. The buy in. But, yeah. but I think the wonderful thing about social media, and this is not to slag off the fringe, so I think it's a wonderful festival, but, um, you know, the, the joy of social media is that you're able to cultivate your own audience now. You've got acts like Mo Gilligan, who's obviously absolutely smashing it, and I think yeah. he's brilliant. And he, you know, never went to the fringe. And yeah. so it isn't the be-all and end-all necessarily, which, which I think is important for people yeah. to remember. A, a, a lot of the comedians go up there purely for the exposure. Mm. you know mm. it's, it's it's just to get noticed it's another way of getting noticed but as you say with the social media now acts like you've hit the nail on the head mo gilligan is taking off it really mm. is yeah and, and yeah. i think that's pretty great and i actually think that's a lot fairer because it's like you look at someone like mo who's so talented and so yeah. likeable and great yeah and um you know all you need is a phone to do that yeah right? yeah yeah and, and that's that's brilliant and i think that's a really good way for us to make comedy, you know, I think this is a ex private school person, less private school dominated, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, there are so many important voices of which, much, yeah. of which he's obviously one, right? Like yeah, the fact yeah. he has an enormous audience that loves him. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so important. Yeah, yeah. Let, um, moving on from that, who are your favorite comedians or impersonators past or present? I, I love, um Sasha Baron Cohen I think he's so good I think um I actually view like impressions as like um because Coogan is like this as well like it's like I feel like that's like one of the skills you need to create like really interesting satirical characters yeah but, but it's it's like a you know it's like a feather to your bow right like but you, you need that feather but it's not sort of the be all and end all um but yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, Partridge is just amazing. And I'm, I'm so pleased that that's on an establishment channel. Do you know, like, at, you know, that whole series, the BBC, like, yeah, we're committing to Partridge. Because from, in my personal opinion, it's been a really long time since the BBC have committed to comedy that is the pinnacle of British comedy. And I think that yeah. really, really is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, he's great. Yeah, I love James Acaster. I love how... Yeah. He's so clever and subversive. And I've been really getting into the American guys recently. I mean, I th my favorite comedian is Bo Burnham by, by a long way. Like yeah. I watching Inside on Netflix. Um, He's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it was insane. I just, it changed my life. Like, I honestly, like I actually felt like quite depressed after watching it. Cause I was like, this is so good. Like, what the hell am I saying? <laughs> what the fuck? Like, don't give Why? up. You're brilliant. <laughs> well, that's fine. But I just watched that and I was like, this is just, it's just ridiculous. Um, but I also really like Chappelle. I've been yeah, really yeah. With Chappelle of late. And um, yeah, I don't know if I necessarily agree with all the trans stuff he does, but <laughs> I think he's a, I just think he's a stupendous. He is. You know, I think everyone yeah. would have to agree that he is. Just yeah, yeah. And, and like me, do you go to a lot of comedy gigs as a member of the audience? I don't actually. I, um, I don't, and maybe I should do that more, but I think I, 
You know, I actually try to watch a bit less comedy than I used to because, or I try to watch people who are not doing the same things as me, right? So I don't actually watch like, um, not that I view him as the same, but I wouldn't watch like Jonathan Pye or something. No, no. Because, because um, I wouldn't want to copy. I, and I think that's very important. Like if you see a show that's going well, like there's, and it's not even a conscious thing, but it, it can be like a subconscious, like, oh, I'll use that. Do you know what I mean? I'm quite paranoid about, I want my ideas to come from my head rather than maybe like <laughs> of course. inadvertently, you know, cause yeah, just so I found that's actually more helpful because when I first started, I watched so much and I read like all my routines just ended up being bad impressions <laughs> of the people that I was watching. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't watch as much. I love it though. I love watching Netflix oh, specials yeah. and I, yeah. I rewatch loads. Yeah. If 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 you're on a bill with a number of comedians on it, do you stay and watch them all? I I don't actually. Um, I it's been such a long time since that's happened that I've been yeah. on a on a bill with other people. But yeah. I um normally most of them I meet are really nice but you yeah sometimes, you know comedians can be a little bit sort of bitter towards each other and yeah yeah and I, I just don't really like getting involved in that to be yeah. honest so I just sort of I do what I do and then I and you know and then I sort of try and get out of there but that's not well, yeah obviously that's not true loads of them are really nice and friendly yeah yeah of course yeah, good fun. yeah. but um yeah I think it's difficult when you've got a load of attention seekers all being thrown together because I think they probably aren't going to end up getting on that um, my, my first ever comedy show was age mm. seven on a family holiday. Really? And we went to see Les Dawson in Scarborough. Les Dawson. Extraordinary. And a year, year, and, wasn't he a bit blue for a seven year old? Oh, he was, he was fantastic. The whole family was there. Yeah. Um, packed out. Yeah. Saw him then, and I saw him just before he sadly passed on. He was in a performance of an awful comedy a play called Run For Your Wife, and he knew it was terrible, so he gave the audience 10 minutes of stand-up before he did the play. Oh, brilliant. It was extraordinary. And, brilliant. Then, and then a year later, we saw Tommy Cooper, and I wow. got the book. Tommy Cooper was incredible. Yeah. And yeah. then um, just I've, I've just got the buzz. I, I, I designed this enormous spreadsheet with every single mm. act I've seen on it, and I mm. thought, who's going to want to read this or what uh, what this but then i thought i've got something here if i just make it like a little diary or a or a, a yeah, yeah, or something yeah, sure. but how do you how do you keep on top of sort of the new people coming up like how are you so like how, how you know because i like you can the first time you came to watch me i was really not famous at all right so like, how do you yeah you're so how are you so on it richard how are you there's a, lo there's a lot of there's a lot of um word of mouth with audience members i'm not i don't know any mm -hmm. promoters or anything like that i i always put in my blog i'm a paying member of the audience and uh i'm getting to know a lot of similar people like me there's actually somebody online called the comedy nerd and he's a really good lad but um we just sit and talk comedy and mm. it's extraordinary and mm. um there's just something, because I've seen so many over the years, the, the, the first act I saw at the Comedy Store um, was Linda Smith, God bless her, um, mm. uh, and um, uh, Steve, uh, uh, Steve Gribbin, Phil mm. Jupiter's, and top of the bill was Charles Fleischer. And Charles mm. Fleischer was never heard of again because he went to Hollywood and made uh, voice two friend Roger Rabbit. So that's wow. why he never heard of again. He was this zany comedian. Yeah, and I just thought I am passionate about this. Mm. Um, write about it, and it's just taken off, and it, it's it, 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 it's just a wonderful thing. So I'm very, very good. If 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 you said to me what is what is worth seeing in London now, I could give you a very good bill of comedians you've never mm. heard of. Mm. And if you like one out of five of them, I've I've done my job. And, oh, and I'd I'm, love to. I'm you know, very I'm good at them. doing that. Seems I want to hear about the musical comedians because I love musical comedy. It's not something I. Luthi Grafo is back. Yeah, yeah. he's fantastic, yeah. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. He he's playing uh, headliners next week for their twentieth birthday. Him and Hal Cruttenden. Oh great, great! Oh, I will. Uh, I'll make a mental note of that because I. Oh man, yeah, exactly. I, just love it. I love. Um, <laughs> 
I'm about G. Henderson. Have you seen his? Yeah, his, superb. His, superb. His, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I just think putting something to music just helps. Yeah. It's John really Long is very way. good. John, John Long's an old mate of mine who I first saw um, uh, um, in a very tiny comedy club do five minutes, and he's done two mm. Edinburgh shows. He's brilliant with the right. guitar. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll bear that in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. No. It, it. 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 Um. It's. It. It's just a wonderful thing that we're all involved with, and I think it's very, very positive. What's not to love about the art of comedy and making people mm. laugh? Um. I've Thank so much you. enjoyed talking to you. I really have. You've been a fantastic guest. Um. No, is there no. anything else you'd like to say? before we go um have you got any you're on tour at the moment have you got a social uh, yeah well yeah well i don't know when this is coming out but I've, I'm, my tour starts on the first of october yes right. and, um, it's sold marvelously in london brilliant but in the north has sold <laughs> well. well here so, i am to try and promote it yeah, for you <laughs> thank you babe. i appreciate that a lot it's not so badly it's just like i've just been put in massive venues in like manchester i'm like Oh, man. I don't know if I can sell 400 seats in Manchester. That's a lot of seats. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. No, there it goes. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, I am really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, yeah, you saw the work in progress. I've loved performing that. I'm, I, you know, it's I'm doing a few more and then I'll be taking it on the road. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Um, yeah, Good. it's fun. You know, it's really nice when people come out to watch you. It's such a privilege. Brilliant. Well, well, I, for one, will be in the queue to see you very soon again soon. Uh, thanks, mate. I appreciate it a lot. It's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you very much. What is your um, social media just before we go? Uh, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's Josh Berry Comedy on, on Instagram and, and Twitter. And then my website for tour tickets is uh, joshberryofficial.com. Brilliant, mate. Well, all the very best to you, and I will see you again soon. Thanks, Richard. So much. Cheers.